Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin. I'm editor-at-large at America Media, and I want to welcome you to this conversation with Mary Carr, who has a new book out called The Art of Memoir. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jim Martin. <laughs> so I just want to start out with uh, the beginning of the book. Your book has one of the great uh, first sentences I've ever read. No one elected me the boss of memoir, which is terrific, very self-effacing. So what prompted you to write the book, uh, given that no one had elected you the boss Nobody of memoir? Nobody elected me the boss of memoir, but somebody was dumb enough to offer me money to write the book. So I, it's, you're not supposed to say you write for money, but it's a lie in my case. I'm not Oprah, and often when people offer me money to do stuff, I am so inclined. So. That said, I've been teaching memoir for 30 years and, mm -hmm. and uh, thinking about it. Was there any reluctance on your part to tackle the topic? Well, I mean, memoir has had this huge upsurge of readership in the past 20 years. But when I was in graduate school, I heard it likened to inscribing the Lord's Prayer on a grain of rice. It was the province of weirdos. So the idea of putting art on a, on a book that had memoir on it was... I thought maybe people would think I was a knucklehead. Why do you think there was an upsurge of popularity? Where did that all come from? Was there one book that you could point to in the last 20 years, or? Well, you know, St. Augustine's Confessions. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, there, I think Black Boy, in some ways, in the middle of the last century, there was a handful of books. Um, Black Boy, Thomas Barton's Seven Story Mountain, which I know was very important to you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Mary McCarthy's Memories of Catholic Girlhood. Uh, and my mind's just gone completely blank. What's the fourth one? She says, with authority. My oh, Angela. Nabokov. Oh, Nabokov. Nabokov. Yeah. And I think they kind of spawned that next generation that was Maya Angelou and, and a lot of memoirs about um, race, um, which I think, you know, paralleled the civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's the rise of of the subjective in contemporary imagination that people lost faith in figures of authority, um, their president, their priest, their, um, their scientist, you know, people started being busted lying. Mm -hmm. Where did it get this uh, reputation of being, you would say, the province of weirdos? Or, I mean, because all those people you mentioned are really substantial people. Well, I, I, I think a lot of people like Nabokov and Mary McCarthy were big deals before they wrote memoirs. But, Rich, uh, but Richard Wright, who wrote Black Boy, wasn't. I mean, he was just out of the blue. He was a regular. It's not that he wasn't a writer, but um, this book kind of gushed out of him, I think, in 43 40, and came out in 45. Um, I don't know. I mean, I believe in something called the zeitgeist or the Holy Ghost or mm -hmm. whatever, that there is a a literary spirit that kind of moves everybody in the same direction. And as objective icons fell, I think the idea of a personal story started to interest people. Maybe also Freud, the beginning, you know, interpretation of dreams, 1910. So the inner life, the life lived inside a person, I think began to have currency. Mm -hmm. Now, you're very big on, which I, I love this book, by the way. It's a great book. It's beautiful. It's beautifully written. It's funny. It's instructive. You're really big on truth-telling. You spend a lot of time on telling the truth. And uh, you feel um, that if memoirists uh, aren't going to tell the truth, they should be honest about it and say, you know, I'm, I'm not sure, or I'm, gonna, I'm fudging things a little bit. Are you, um, how do you respond when you read a memoir that seems to kind of play fast and loose with the truth? So I'm not asking you to name names, but does it, why does that bother you? Because some people well, might say, oh, I can embellish. And no, I mean, <clears throat> it's none of my business. I mean, that's what I mean when I say I'm not the boss of it. I mean, you can do it, you can choose your own way to do it, and people have. For me personally, I just found, if I could make stuff up, I would never have kind of looked at the painful or difficult things that wound up really being the emotional hearts of, of my own books. I would just make up that I was like a really nice person and everybody else was a jerk uh, in that, you know, traditional Christian fashion. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I mean, I, I just would, for me, um, the truth lies buried. And if you give yourself an excuse not to look at it, I mean, you don't have to be a memoirist to know this. You know, I mean, anybody with a big inner life, 
uh, knows that often you have to wrestle with yourself to get underneath the easy assumptions. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's easy to write something that's just not true. I mean, it's, you can embellish, but uh, I think it is harder to get at the kind of real emotional truth, which is right? what you're getting at. Do you, um, do you, are there a lot of memoirs? I mean, most memoirs that I read or try to be as honest as possible. Other people, I mean, not naming names, but is there a significant number of memoirs who kind Oh, of I'll name names. I okay, got no problem naming, naming <laughs> names. No, I mean, James Fry mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, the three cups of horse dookie guy, you know, who, you know, it's not like that, you know, we're both spent a lot of time on television saying, oh, all these people make everything up. This is common for the genre. All the memoirists I know, and I have known some of the great ones, uh, you know, Jeffrey and Tobias Wolf, Maxine Hong Kingston, uh, Catherine Harrison, I mentioned, uh, Maya Angelou. I mean, they all wrote out of a real, almost a kind of despair to try to understand a difficult period. So they were kind of driven toward the truth, and the truth was the goal. Um, so I think most people are driven to nonfiction. Again, you know, there, I, there's a woman who said, you know, these books are about 83% true. That's perfectly fine, but I think it's great to tell the reader. Why, if, if it's okay, then just tell the reader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, not, don't be kind of vague and try to cast aspersions on the whole genre. Mm -hmm. Now, at one point you say, in terms of finding the truth, you actually encourage uh, writers to do a bit of what I would call Ignatian contemplation, which I was delighted to see in the book. Um, you know, where you kind of imagine yourself back in the scene, you know, when you were growing up or uh, do you, have you used that a lot for your books, that particular technique? And you, maybe you can describe it to, for people, how you do it. Well, um, in Ignatian spirituality, which I'm in no, no, certainly I'm a novice at, um, you compose a scene with your senses. You try to place yourself in a gospel story or something, thinking what would the... What would the end smell like, you know, with the animals and Jesus' is, baby Jesus is being born? It'd be cold, it's the desert at night. What are the clothes on your body? Are they rough or smooth? I think my memory, um, all of us have that experience of walking in someplace that smells like your mother's house and just being waylaid. Um, smell is the most primal or primordial. It's kind of the first sense and often has a lot of emotion attached to it. Um, so I think my memory naturally works that way and I encourage my students to try to cultivate that. How do they respond? Are they are most able to do it? To kind of go back in their in their lives and place themselves in a scene? I, I, I'm surprised. I mean I, I work with young writers but they're very super interior mm -hmm. human beings anyway. Mm -hmm. You know they're very inward nerdy have you done this with all your books? When you're, when you're trying to recreate a scene, to kind of go back? That's how I remember. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I, I do kind of, I sometimes think about things, you know, like anybody does. Well, can't have been January because we, we've got shorts on in this photograph, you know, so it can't have been here, and you sort of try to figure things out. But most of the things I'm writing about are very vivid, almost too vivid. It's like you know, somebody who's been in Vietnam. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Kind of my, mm -hmm. my uh, awful childhood, mm -hmm. so. Now you talk about, uh, I love the chapter dealing with the beloveds. I thought that was really illuminating. Um, I was actually pleasantly surprised how many memoirs that you mentioned actually do check with people they're mentioning, uh, families and friends. I mean, I do that, um, and I, I, I don't know many memoirs, so I didn't know if that was common. I was also surprised at, uh, you say how frequently uh, people say fine, you know, even about painful stuff. Did that nobody, surprise you? Yeah. Nobody has ever told me not to write something. And, and I think the key is if you're, if you're writing a book, it's sort of like if you're telling a story at, at, a dinner, at the dinner table. If you're telling a story at the dinner table and you say, you know, I know you might remember this differently, but I have this really powerful image. Nobody at the dinner table is gonna say, they will say, you weren't even born when that happened. Right. But no one would deny that you think that happened. Right. So, you know, memoir is dealing with the, the truth of memory, not the truth of history. There's a Jesuit named Rick Curry who likes to tell the story that uh, he was telling a very funny anecdote about Jesuit life. 
and he got this big laugh. And another guy who was at the, ta the table said, actually, it happened like this. And Rick said, you tell it your way. You see if you get as big of a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, right? Um, every great memoir lives or dies based 100% on voice. Um, you have a great voice, by the way, in your, in your books. You've taught at Syracuse University for some time. Is it possible to teach writers how to find their voice? And how do you go about doing that? How well, do I've got to say, I mean, I talk a lot about my students. I've been teaching for 30 years. I taught in, in the academic ghetto around Boston and Cambridge. And, and um, the students in my graduate program are very, we get like hundreds and hundreds, sometimes thousands of applications for 12 positions. So um, they're extremely good. They mm -hmm. come, they're, right. they're very good. They come pretty much able to write. So I think you can teach people certain things and you can kind of steer them away from the ways they kid themselves about who they're gonna be mm -hmm. on the page. Do you think, they, do, they, do they already come with a voice more or less into your program? I think most yeah. of them come pretty much having a way to write. The other question that's related to that um, is you have a very distinctive voice, which I love, and I would say it's very conversational. It's very chatty, it's very conversational, you use colloquialisms. Uh, do you ever find that's a, I mean, you're an established author, so maybe it's not a struggle, but uh, a problem in terms of what editors want. I mean, if you put a colloquialism or a contraction or do you find yourself bumping up against that? And people say, well, that's not, you know, that's not the King's English or the Queen's English. Is that a struggle? That, I just, wh was it a struggle? It, it has been a struggle in the past, and I just always said, it's idiom. Mm -hmm. That's how I speak. It's idiomatic. And actually, no. I mean, most people just leave me alone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're pretty nice about it. You're lucky. I'm lucky, right? What's your all-time favorite memoir? I could never. How about top three? Top three, I mean, St. Saint, Saint Augustine's Confessions. Why is that? Because that's a difficult book for a lot of people. What do you like I about it? I think he it? was our first sex addict. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, uh, I think he was trying to tell the truth. I don't know. I guess in a way it was so radical to write in the first person then. So I think, I think read in historical context, Mm -hmm. It's very interesting for me as a memoirist mm -hmm. because it was one of the first first uses of memoir that, that I know in, in, uh, in the Western tradition anyway. Um, Black Boy, uh, Speak Memory, Woman Warrior. I mean, I have to go with the last century because there are too many in this century now. Oh, Michael Hare's Dispatches, mm -hmm. I think. Which you is, write about very movingly in this book. It's one of the great books about, not just about war, but about human consciousness, I think. Why do you like writing memoirs? I actually don't. You don't? It's, it's um, when I was 10 years old, I wrote in my journal, when I grow up, I will write one half poetry and one half autobiography. Like, where does that come from? Um, I was always fascinated by the, the genre, always just, that Maya Angelou book, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, you know, she's writing about being sexually assaulted. I was sexually assaulted when I was a little girl. And it made me feel so much less lonely hmm. to read that. And just that, uh, the Helen Keller book, when I was a little girl, you know, I just thought, wow, you know, she became a writer. Can't I? You know, it kind of, uh, they, they shored me up in some really, really primitive way. I mean, obviously these people aren't my friends, but I, you know, neither was Winnie the Pooh, and I believe that, so. <laughs> well, thanks. Uh, I want to thank you for spending time with us today. Congratulations on your new book, The Art thank of you. Memoir, which is beautiful. Thank you. And thanks for coming to America House. Thank you, Jim Martin. For America Media, I'm Father Jim Martin. God bless you. Mm -hmm.